Okay, well, with that, I wanted to make mention, you know, over the years, brethren, I have had the opportunity, being now with God's church for some 40, 41 years, to hear a lot of arguments about the holy days. Lots of arguments out there about the holy days from whether or not they're even legitimate as to whether or not maybe we should only be keeping one. Some think that really the only holy day that one should keep is Passover. Others think, well, maybe you should keep two, Passover and Pentecost Sunday. You know, Pentecost is, is good. But as far as the fall holy days, I mean, come on, people will argue. That's all legalism. That's all Torah stuff. That's Jewish. They, that doesn't apply to modern-day Christians. As a matter of fact, people get rather hostile and somewhat visceral when you begin to push at them a little bit in respect to some of these what they misconceive and are misguided about thinking are Jewish holidays or holy days when in fact they're not. I mean, they're listed there in Leviticus 23, as many of us know, and those holy days were put there and portrayed not to just the tribe of Judah, as many of you understand, but to the whole house of Israel. Why? Because these are God's feast days. These aren't just for the Jews. They're not just for that particular tribe of Israel, and I think many of you know that. But as I say, there, there's a lot of a lot of debate, a lot of argument, a lot of, as I have already said, hostility toward these particular holy days. I have to admit, I've been keeping now the holy days for two-thirds of my life. My children, my two daughters, that's all they know. They, they've never kept a, a Christmas or an Easter or a Valentine's Day or anything along those lines, uh, observed Halloween in any religious fashion. Um, you know, as they would say, as some and most uh, have done in their lives. I mean, even I kept and observed Christmas as a little guy with my Lionel train around the Christmas tree for many, many years as I was growing up with my mom and my dad. And I must admit, I still have that nostalgic feeling, and Margie and I will be caught occasionally going down in a snowstorm into downtown Cleveland when the lights are lit there on Public Square just to kind of, if nothing else, kind of a, appreciate the, the nostalgia, not so much of Christmas, but just the beauty and the, the, the warmth and the, the comfort and the, just a, that old, uh, what you could say, uh, feeling that comes along with such a beautiful environment. As a matter of fact, I remember one time I was on a sales call down in Wheeling, West Virginia. I was staying overnight in Wheeling, West Virginia. A wonderful place. No, nothing wrong with Wheeling. But at any rate, uh, I didn't know what to do in the night. Didn't know what to do. So I had dinner, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to you know, just go back to the hotel room. And the, and the waiter told me, he said, hey, have you ever seen the Festival of Lights? It was around Christmas time, by the way. I said, Festival of Lights? What are you talking about? He says, yeah, over by Ogilvy Park, there's this thing called Festival of Lights where you go up there and you see all these decorations and what have you. I said, no, I never did that. He said, yeah, go on up there. Take, take, a, take a gander at it. So I went up there. I drove in, got in line like everybody else, and kind of followed everybody around <laughs> Ogilvy Park to see the Festival. Of lights. And I have to admit, it was quite creative. I mean, they had all kinds of characters lit up and different designs and uh, things to the music, you know, with a kind of syncopated and so forth. And it, it was, you know, I mean, it was an evening of entertainment, needless to say, and it was a, a clean entertainment. And I got back to the hotel room okay. <laughs> but what I want to say is that, you know, there's a lot of tradition associated with these holidays. Uh, I think all of us come to understand, especially during that season, whether it is Christmas, even Easter, and now Halloween is now a close, I don't know how close, but it is second. I didn't know if you realize that. It's second on the most uh, profitable, economic, impacting holiday for gear and garb and, and paraphernalia uh, toward the uh, celebration of the holiday simply because of, I guess, everybody's into ghouls and witches and goblins and all kinds of gruesome and gory kind of stuff. And they sell a whole bunch of things uh, for Halloween today. And needless to say, it has, as Christmas and Easter, Valentine's Day, Ash Wednesday, you name it, all these days grown into quite a tradition. People, when they see the advertisements coming on television, everybody starts getting in the spirit. You know, everybody starts getting into that old feeling that comes with these holidays. Now, like I said, I have grandchildren. They're second generation removed from these holidays. And I got to thinking this year, for some reason, for whatever reason, I, I was reflecting on the fact of how the holy days should become our tradition. We should really try 
to develop family traditions, that we should really try to develop personal traditions that are associated with these holy days, because guess what they do? They validate, brethren. They drive home the richness of God's truth because the holy days have definitely that over the standard Christian traditional holidays. There is no connection to the Bible with the standard traditional Christian holidays. There's no connection of Christmas to the birth of Christ. There's no connection of Easter and the celebration of the resurrection and life of Christ in your Bible. As a matter of fact, the Passover is the observance of his death. That's what your Bible, it's the opposite. It's the contrarian. It's counter-distinctive to the observance purpose and objective that we as Christians ought to have during that springtime. It's not his, his life and resurrection. That comes with Pentecost, as we understand. Fifty days on the count thereafter to uh, bring that into focus and to bring that as a separate phase, a separate segment, a separate point of observance and celebration. So these holy days do, I believe, require our attention to pay some honor to developing the traditions that sh should and you would think would be so appropriate for us as true Christians to hold and to develop as much as we can with our families, with our children, with our grandchildren. Uh, I've got some scriptures I want to share with you as we move along in the um, presentation here toward the close that I, I, I want to share with you that illustrates God's request, requirement, command, expectation that we should be engaged in regarding these holy days and the way uh, of life. But clearly, the Bible is very clear on these holy days being the days of observance, being the underscoring days of celebration and connection. I want to take some time today though this will be fundamental and though this will be basic, I want to go back and revisit, review these holy days and where they're located in the New Testament. The New Testament. Not the Old Testament. We know they're there in the Old Testament. No question about it. But so many people debate the legitimacy of the holy days in this alleged New Covenant day because they claim that there are no significant appeals of obligation for New Testament Christians to adhere to and to continue to keep and observe these what are viewed as Old Testament Jewish holy days, which is erroneous from the start because they're not Old Testament Jewish holy days. Yeah, they're Old Testament, of course, because that's where they were originally established, but they are God's holy days. Period. They're not the Jews. They're not Moses' holy days. They're not the prophets' holy days. They're God's holy days. And God has put on expectations and expects our obligatory behavior toward these days. And the New Testament proves, without a doubt, undebatable, that they were still keeping these and observing these days decades after Jesus had gone back to the Father and ascended to his right side. Over here, if you've got your Bibles open, let's go to Luke for a moment and start there. Luke chapter 2. Now this goes back to the context. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in context. I'm going to probably be, as some would say, proof texting a lot, only because of time, not because I'm trying to deceive you or, or be disingenuous about anything. But due to time, I'm going to stay along this abbreviated method of, of kind of just focusing on what's cogent to my uh, subject here. But in verse 41 of Luke 2, I want to bring your attention to this. You know the context here where Jesus, being 12 years old, but I want to point something out here, verse 41. This is regarding Joseph, the physical overseer that Mary was married to, her physical husband, not Jesus' father, but uh, certainly his mother, Mary, as well. It says here in verse 41, now, it's, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Easter? No, Passover. It says Passover. His parents went to Jerusalem every year 
And when he was 12 years old, that's Jesus, Yeshua, they went to, up to Jerusalem after, look at this now, the custom of the feast, the tradition of the feast, the ordinance of the feast. It was the custom, the habit. It was the rule of their culture at that time. Here in Luke chapter 4, just a few pages over, notice this in uh, verse Fourteen, we pick up the context after the temptation, Jesus now coming out of the wilderness, the temptation with Satan, the confrontation, we know all of that in the verses preceding. But in verse 14, breaking into the context, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. That was the city. Jesus of Nazareth, we call him, as many of us have uh, come to become familiar with that uh, title or that term. And as his, again, etho, that's the Greek, etho. And it, again, means his habit. It was his manner. It was essentially the prescribed by law. This was what Jesus did. This is, if you want to follow Jesus, this is what he did. It was his custom. It was his habit. This is what he did. This was the model, the habit that he established. And why people don't recognize this for what it is, is beyond me. But nevertheless, here's the point. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sunday? On Monday? Tuesday? No, he went in on the Sabbath. And it's obvious what Sabbath we're talking about. We're not talking about the Sunday Sabbath, as some Protestants uh, perhaps would want you to believe. We're talking about the Jewish Sabbath at this time, if you want to put it in the context of where Jesus was going to church, at the synagogue. That's when the Jews met. They met on, and everyone knows that, uh, on um, Sabbath day, which would be during the week. Uh, we know it as Saturday and stood up for to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of Isaiah. So we know the rest of that story in, in this particular case. Now let's go to Luke 22 to see if indeed at the end of his ministry anything had changed. We know from 12 years old he had been going with his parents, it said, every Passover. That's what it said there in Luke chapter 2. Now we're three and a half years down, the, well, actually we're... From that point, we're uh, almost 21 and a half years down the road because here we're three and a half years uh, essentially into his ministry. Toward the end, he's sitting down now for his last supper with his disciples here in chapter 22. And he states in this particular case, in verse 7, we break into the context, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. Verse 8, and he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Easter meal. <laughs> Is that what it says? No, it does not say that. It says the Passover meal. Here, Jesus, at the end of his ministry, some 21 years plus from the time we read in Luke 2, Luke 22 now we're in, still keeping what he and his parents were doing back in Luke 2. Nothing changed. Not one iota changed in his custom. Here he was again telling his disciples, in this particular case, Peter and John, to go prepare a place so that we can eat the Passover. Verse 14 now, breaking down here, chapter 22, book of Luke, verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to have this ham sandwich and meat with you, you know, pork. Uh, that's the tradition, I think, isn't it? To have a, uh, some kind of a ham with an Easter meal. <laughs> it's not here. It is really not here. And I say this only for effect because the contrast is stunning, is it not? of how traditional Christians have developed these traditions and they claim they're connected to the Bible and they're nowhere near. There's no connection. Zero. And I could go to Matthew, I could go to Mark, I can go to John in those Gospels, which 
are the records of Jesus' ministry, the, the records from four different points of view per, pertaining to his buddies and his customs and his habits and what he did. And guess what? There is absolutely no record of Jesus having ham on Easter or observing his birthday even, for that matter. Not even calling a Christmas, but just observing his birthday. There's no record of that either. As a matter of fact, the Bible is quite silent on when he was born. There's notions that most likely he was probably born in the fall. But that's all they are, are notions, implications. And you can maybe get close to where it was perhaps the Feast of Trumpets, perhaps the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. But it's very, very hard and by far nowhere near being dogmatic about the fact that Jesus was born on the Feast of Trumpets. Jesus was born on the first day of the uh, uh, Feast of Tabernacles. You, can, you can't do it. There's notions, implications. There's nowhere near, though, any connection with Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, Ash Wednesday, putting ash on your forehead. Where'd that come from? I mean, I remember one employee of mine came in. I didn't mean no disrespect. He came in with the ash on his forehead, and I asked him. He's got a little spot on his forehead. He said, well, it's Ash Wednesday. I said, ooh. I didn't realize that because I'm not used to it. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. I just didn't know. So here you have Luke 22, uh, and in verse 14 and 16, we're talking about the days of unleavened bread. We're talking about Passover. Over here, Mark 14, look at this, Mark 14. This is a different individual. This is Mark, not Luke, Mark. Let's see his record. Over here, chapter 14, verse 1, after two days was the Passover and unleavened bread, and the chief priests, scribes, sought how they might take him by craft and kill him, put him to death. They said, not on the feast, lest there be an uproar in the people. So here the, there was concern about killing Jesus uh, around the feasts of unleavened bread. Uh, we have here verse 12 of same chapter, Mark 14, verse 12. In the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where do you want us to go to prepare that you may eat the Passover? Same thing that we just read in Luke. Same thing. This is now, though, from Mark. This is from Mark. Same report, basically the same uh, observations. Let's go over here to Luke, uh, Matthew. I'm sorry, Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew now, chapter 12 for a moment. Matthew chapter 12 and shift here a little bit to the Sabbath day. Chapter 12. Uh, Jesus here in verse 1. The time, uh, at the time, Jesus went on the Sabbath through the uh, corn. It was primarily wheat, though, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the ears uh, and to uh, eat. And essentially what this was talking about is they were taking the, you know, the, uh, the wheat and, and kind of stripping it down to get to where the, the uh, substance was of what they were eating. But when they did that, see, that's threshing. That's work. Can't do that on the Sabbath. That's threshing. That, that was their big mistake. And so they got called down on this oral law. Because, see, that's Talmudic. It's not from the Torah. That's Talmudic. That's, that's from the oral law. Now, and really, if the truth were known, that's what Jesus was really taking to task a lot of the times. It wasn't so much. As a matter of fact, it wasn't at all the Torah. It was primarily the oral law and all of the things that the Pharisees legislated of the do's and don'ts that were associated with uh, much of their culture. But at any rate, uh, the Pharisees call him down on it. You can read for the sake of time. I won't read the whole context. But Jesus kicks back at them. Uh, he tells them about the time when uh, David, I think it was, uh, ate from in the temple, and um, he comes down here to illustrate a very important point that he wanted to make to them. He says, the Son of Man is Lord even of Sunday? No. Sabbath day. Sabbath day. He's the Lord of the Sabbath day. And, of course, we understand that uh, the Sabbath was created for man. Our pleasure, our work, our enhancement, our uh, beneficiary uh, uh, for our benefits so that we might be able to use it for augmenting our relationship with God. Now let's go to Acts. These are the Acts of the early New Testament church. And let's go ahead and advance to probably about 15 or so years after Jesus Christ had ascended back to the Father. This is 15 years post-resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And here we are in chapter uh, 13, and let's uh, break into the context here. Uh, verse 42, 
where we uh, have a situation developing. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So here Paul is focusing on the Sabbath day. And, and many would say, well, yeah, but, you know, that's where the Jews were on the Sabbath day. That's where he could get the biggest and largest audience. But if you notice, he was talking about Gentiles and proselytes here as well, individuals that were non-Jewish, non-Israelitish, non-Hebrew, that were taken up and stricken with the interest and attention that the preaching of Paul and Barnabas, in this case, generated. And they were also then in attendance there on the Sabbath day at the locations where Paul here and Barnabas were preaching. Now let's advance a little bit more, a few more years down the road here to Acts 17. Now we're probably about 20 or so years after Jesus was resurrected, chapter 17. And we uh, proceed here with the Apostle Paul traveling, passed through Amphipolis and uh, uh, Apollonia, uh, Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where the synagogue was of the Jews. Verse 2, here it was now. And Paul, as his etho, same word that we read about Jesus over there in Nazareth, keeping the Sabbath day, it was Paul's manner, Paul's habit, 20 plus years after Jesus had resurrected, here the Apostle Paul is doing what? Keeping Sunday? Did it change? At this point, was Paul keeping Sunday? Absolutely not. Here it is. Look at this. Verse 2. As his manner was, went in unto them, that is these Jews, three Sabbath days, and reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Three consecutive Sabbaths, week after week after week. Now, granted, in this particular case, some may say during the week, uh, that it was being done, well, that remains to be uh, seen because as, as you uh, proceed here uh, in chapter 18, a few pages over, uh, again, you will see that it wasn't only also Jews on the Sabbath, but here you will definitely see there were also Gentiles, and in this case, Greeks, that uh, the uh, writer of Luke, uh, writer Luke here who wrote Acts, Mentions Chapter 18, verse 1, notice this. Paul departs from Athens, comes to Corinth, finds a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontius lately, and came from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla, they came from Italy. The reason being, they got thrown out. They didn't want Jews in Italy, so they threw them out. So Priscilla and Aquila had to move out, and they met up with Paul. Verse 3, and because he was of the same craft, Paul, he was a tent maker on the side, uh, trying to make money, of course, to keep... Uh, as they say, the wolf from the door, and provide himself some income, abode with them. This is verse 3, Acts 18. And wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath persuaded and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So here what you have are the Greeks who are hearing about this way are actually being persuaded to attend church services on the Sabbath day with the Jews. That's what's going on. And so here you find the Greeks, the Gentiles, mixed in with the Jews on Sabbath in their synagogues, of all things. And therein lies now Paul uh, going ahead and uh, preaching to them again on the Sabbath, as he did in Acts 17, three Sabbaths in a row. And, and in this case, too, I mean, I, I understand that they also met in homes and so on, but they also met in the synagogues. As a matter of fact, the Christian way, the Christian movement was oftentimes accused of being nothing more than an extension of Judaism or Hebrewism. As a matter of fact, it actually had the reputation of being a new segment or a new phase or an advancement of or a revision of Judaism. And then uh, therein lies why in many cases uh, those new early Testament uh, Christians met along with the uh, Jews in the synagogues as well. But here in uh, Acts 18 and in verse 21, we continue to read, but, uh, and breaking into the context, let me go up to 20. When they desired him to tarry longer, talking uh, here again about uh, Paul and them, uh, and, and I think it was at Ephesus, verse 19, it talks about that. 
He consented not. He could not concede to that. Instead, he bade them for farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed to, oh, I'm sorry, he sailed to Ephesus from there. And so here you have, and most scholars and uh, commentaries will tell you what he was referencing there in Jerusalem was the feast, all things, of tabernacles. He wanted to go to the feast of tabernacles and keep that particular feast in Jerusalem. Now, chapter 20, a few more years, uh, or actually uh, just about one year later, uh, he again now, it's in the spring, chapter 20, Paul's on the road again. He sails away, verse 6, from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. So here now we've got him keeping Sabbath, we've got him keeping Passover, we've got him keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, and now we've got him on the days of unleavened bread. None of, the, none of this Christmas stuff, not, no Valentine's Day, no Halloween, no Easter, no Sunday, none of that. Not connected in your Bible at all. And these are the recorded acts, brethren, of the early New Testament church of which uh, the book of Acts was written for and about. Acts um, 20, verse 6, and uh, dropping down, look at this, verse 16. Paul determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, he was in a hurry, if it were all possible for him to be at Jerusalem, he's going back to Jerusalem now, for the day of Pentecost. <laughs> There's the day of Pentecost. He's keeping the day of Pentecost. Without question here, brethren, I say these things and show you these things for the purpose of establishing the credibility of which you are connected to. You, you are observing these days that are very rich in meaning, very accepted, and very fundamental and original to that early New Testament church. And sadly, much of this was, of course, as we understand through history, stamped out by very violent means and changes, which I will share with you here in some of those cases in a moment. Chapter 27 of the book of Acts. Chapter 27 of the book of Acts. Now, here we are. We are now 30-plus years, 30-plus years, three decades after Jesus was resurrected. 30 years, 27, verse, let's see here, verse 9, he talks, uh, again, he's traveling. And uh, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because you're going to find out this was in the fall season, in the Mediterranean Sea, when the uh, Eurachlodon winds kick up and the waves get high and people get seasick out there on those boats, and it gets pretty rough, uh, in that particular portion of the world on the Mediterranean Sea, it says here, sailing was now dangerous because the fast, the fast was now already past. Paul admonished them. And my middle margin says the fast was the 10th day of the seventh month, that's Tishri, which we all understand to be the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, as they would say today uh, in the Hebrew, Yom Kippur in the, uh, this particular case. So here now, 30 plus years later, we are told and, and included into the um, information that the early New Testament church was keeping the Day of Atonement. You come from a long, good, long, hearty stock of folks going all the way back to the original apostles and those that um, in some cases as well gave their lives over these particular holy days. I know it's hard to believe. It is hard to believe in our modern 21st century when we have civil rights and human rights and living here especially in the United States to think about how one could be killed for keeping Easter or not keeping Easter, I'm, I'm sorry, for not keeping Easter or killed for keeping Passover or because you refuse to observe God on Sunday, you insist on keeping the Sabbath that you could be fed to a lion or have your home confiscated and your family split up and separated and you incarcerated in jail. Hard to believe because we're so far removed from those circumstances and that situation. And yet in other parts of the world, as we know even right now in the Middle East, 
uh, individuals who claim the name of Jesus Christ are being abused, martyred, and killed as we speak right now in other nations. Uh, so don't think that we're that far removed because we really aren't in that regard and in some cases uh, in other parts of the world. But here again, going back here now to the book of Corinthians, I want to bring your attention back to a very familiar portion of Scripture that I know all of you are um, quite familiar with, chapter 5, 1 Corinthians. And this also, brethren, close to almost 30 years, 25 to 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul is talking about Purging, therefore, the old leaven, verse 7, chapter 5, first book of Corinthians. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And again, that really, you can construe that as a lot of double talk if you're not careful, because unless you understand that they were physically unleavened, and that's why Paul uses the comparison. Notice this, he talks about, he says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. In other words, deleaven yourself, so that you may be a new lump as you already are deleavened. How does that make sense? If I'm already deleavened, why are you telling me to unleaven myself? I'm already unleavened. Well, yeah, but you're unleavened physically. So as you're physically unleavened, you need to spiritually unleaven yourself. That's what Paul's talking about here. That's not double talk. What Paul's saying is this was during the days of unleavened bread, and he's simply saying, look, you need to be spiritually unleavened as you are physically unleavened. That's, that's the, what you could say the comparison in the metaphor that he's using to leverage the understanding, the spiritual understanding he wanted his audience to grasp. And then he says and proceeds that, uh, and states, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep horete, horete. And uh, he says here, let us keep uh, heorte, that's, you know, the feast, let's keep it. Let's keep this feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, the spiritual aspect, but with the unleavened uh, bread or uh, what you could say attitude even of sincerity and truth. So here again we see uh, continued uh, substantiation for the particular uh, days of unleavened bread and of course the, uh, the Passover. Go to the uh, Gospel of John for a moment. I skipped over that. Let me go back to that for a moment. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Here Jesus being confronted by his blood half-brothers, maybe even a sister or two. Here in chapter 7, we read this, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, um, would not walk in Jewry, but he, uh, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast, or you should just say the feast, God's feasts of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that your disciples may see the works that you do. For there is no man that does anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. You know, they say, hey, you want to be known, Jesus? You need to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. Get down there. You want to be known by everybody? Well, hey, that's where everybody is. Go down there and, and show them who you are, buddy. You know, that's what it's all about. And Jesus kicks back here and he says, uh, neither did his brethren believe in him. And that's brethren is not his disciples. These are his half-blood brothers. And uh, he goes on and he says, no, no, my, my time has not yet come. Your time's always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go you unto this feast. I'm not going to go up yet unto this feast for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, they went, uh, then he went also up unto the feast, however, not openly. He, he went up there stealth. He went up there kind of off the grid, undercover, so to speak. He kept a very low-key uh, profile, but as it were in secret. The Jews, the hubbub was, uh, seeking him at the feast, said, well, where is he? You know, the, the, the buzz was, where's Jesus? Where's this uh, Galilean? Where, where's Jesus of Nazareth, the one who's doing all the miracles? A lot of buzzing going on about where Jesus was in respect to the feast, meaning also they expected him there. They expected him there at the Feast of Tabernacles. And you'll notice here, it goes on, the Jews, uh, verse 12, and there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, he's a good man, others, nah, 
but he deceives the people. So there was a lot of, like I said, talk going on. Howbeit no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, uh, How knows this man letters, having never learned? And so we understand that he not only came out of his secret mode there during the middle of the feast, but he ended up teaching there uh, in the temple. Of course, there we have in verse 37, the last day, the great day of the feast. Many will debate that perhaps that was just the last day of the feast, not the great last day, which is a separate day attached to, the eighth day attached to, the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. But any way you look at it, here you have a record of Jesus Christ during his ministry, while he was in his 30s, he himself is keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. You want to live like Jesus? Brethren and people on the DISC program, all I can tell you is, if you want to live like Jesus, you keep the Feast of Tabernacles because Jesus never kept an Easter or a Christmas in his life. Never did. Never did. Here we see what Jesus was indeed uh, keeping without, uh, without a doubt. Here in the history of the church, there's so much documentation in respect to the changes and how they occurred and the arguments and debates over issues of this type of the holidays versus the holy days and how Passover was changed to Easter and all these movements and initiatives that occurred from these individuals who were attempting to compromise the original apostolic teachings. And here out of the Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition, i just like to quote this just to illustrate to you some of the history associated with what we're talking about and how these changes occurred. Because my point in this, brethren, is that the changes did not occur in your Bible. They did not occur in the Bible. There is no license, there is no evidence to allow us or afford us the ability to parlay change to execute or dissuade from the original teachings of these holy days to these traditional, as we've come to know them, alleged Christian holidays. There's none. Zero. And rightly so, if you do a little study on church history, you'll find, like here in the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition on page 828, I read this, quote, There is no indication of the observance of the Easter festival in the New Testament or in the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. The first Christians continued the observance of the Jewish, they call it the Jewish, holy days, but it, we know it's God's holy days, uh, festivals, they say. Continuing the quote here, though in a new spirit, as commemorations of events which those festivals had foreshadowed. Like in the book of Colossians, they are shadows of things to come. Remember what I told you over a couple of weeks ago? All the holy days are underscored, established on the platform of events physical, intrinsic events. Every holy day in its most fundamental definition, literal definition, has an association to a literal event, an action, an event, an intrinsic physical event. They are based off of and from. And they, some have been fulfilled, the spring ones, have already been to a large extent fulfilled with the action, with the event that is associated with it, but the fall holy days are very prophetic, meaning they are history. They will be history someday, but they're history in advance at this point in our day and age because at this point in the timeline of God's saga of redeeming humankind, they have not yet happened. They're still going to be, and so they're prophetic in that regard, history in advance. Now, from the... Uh, Fourth century scholar Socrates Scholasticus, Ecclesiastical History, chapter 22, I'll ask you to spell that later. Uh, I uh, go ahead and I quote here where he states, Neither the apostles, therefore, nor the gospels have anywhere imposed Easter. The Savior and his apostles have enjoined us by not law to keep this feast, Easter, and that the observance originated not by legislation of the apostles, but as a custom, the facts themselves indicate. 
as a custom. And as the facts themselves indicate, if you would get into the context of what uh, Socrates here is talking about, is the fact that the Catholic Church established these customs out of the Holy Roman Catholic Universal, Universal Church, as what Catholic means, Universal Church, they established customs of change and assumed to themselves the authority to make these legislative moves to where if you didn't concede and conform, well, you know the rest of the story, they killed you. They confiscated your home. They split your families up. They fed you to lions. They did whatever they wanted to do to you because the law of the land was, and the church ruled. The church ruled. And I know it's hard for us to get our minds around that when we sit comfortably here in uh, the United States of America or, any, for that matter, any part of North America and even in parts of Europe and so on and in the West and in, in, the, in many cases, uh, many situations of the world. But suffice it to say, brethren, these situations did exist and they were very treacherous and very traumatic for so many people who, who indeed experienced those things back then. Now, I brought my Catholic catechism book with me. <laughs> yeah, zoom in on that. <laughs> it's old. You can see it's well studied. <laughs> I was a good Catholic. No, I wasn't a good Catholic. I wasn't even Catholic, believe me. <laughs> but uh, over here on page uh, 176, now this is uh, written by a Catholic priest. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, the foreword here is um, uh, Richard Downey, Archbishop of Liverpool. The Archbishop of Liverpool. And on page 176, I've used this on television, by the way, but I want you to hear what he quotes in this catechetical book. This is a catechism book for the, for the Catholics. And this is what he says. Listen to this. This is what he says. The church, I'm quoting now, quote, the church, speaking with divine authority, says that all her members must honor God at least weekly by the offering of sacrifice, and naturally this should be done on the day set apart by God for the purpose. Incidentally, I'm still quoting, incidentally, he says, incidentally, there is no proof in Scripture that God willed the Sabbath to be changed from Saturday to Sunday. So that non-Catholics, that's all you Protestants, by the way, who do not accept the value of tradition as the source of faith, tradition of the Catholic Church, that's what we're saying, should logically still observe Saturday as the Sabbath. Unquote. From the Catechism book. Brethren, teach your children. Teach your children to obey God. That's the truth. We're cutting through this darkness. You are. Your eyes have been scaled back. You've been uh, allowed to see things that very few people today see because you put priority on this. You understand that this truth pleases God and your abidance to it, your adhering to it is a preservation of the truth in a very dark, dark world and growing darker by the day. And it is your, your lot to be those shining lights in this dark world, to give direction and to give meaning to the truth that right now appears to be falling by the wayside in so many ways. It's far and few between. Turn with me over here to the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let's read something from the, these books that Moses wrote regarding God's law and see what God expects of us as parents and as people who understand these truths and, and recognize and appreciate these apostolic teachings and which connect back to the very beginnings of when these things were established with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Joshua, and all the rich history that goes on with all of that. Here in chapter 6, verse 1, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that you might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command uh, you and your son, your son's son, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, 
that it may be well with you, that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you in the land that flows with milk and honey. And then you have the Shema. This is what is so uh, popular in terms of this particular statement where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The monotheistic mantra of, of the God of Israel in this particular case. Verse 5, And you shall love the Lord your God. You shall love Yahweh, thy Elohim, in the Hebrew which is a uniplural word. You shall love Yahweh of the God family, is in essence what we're being told here uh, in this regard. And he says, with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might, and these words, verse 6, Deuteronomy 6, which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently. That's with enthusiasm. You shall teach them with passion. You shall teach them with conviction. So why? So your children will believe it. <laughs> so your children will understand it's the truth. Oh, yeah, God, is, he keeps the Sabbath day. Yeah, he wants, he wants you to keep the Sabbath day. Why? I don't know. He just said it. Well, what, what's the value of it? I don't know. It's just good to keep it. Yeah. No, 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 no. You teach it. You teach it with passion. You teach it with conviction. You teach it with persuasion. You teach it with the whys, wherefores, and hows so that the kids understand, so the young people understand, the young adults understand, so they grow up, and guess what they do? Teach their children. Some, I know some Christians in God's church today that are seventh generation Sabbath keepers. That's a convicted family. Seventh generation, seven generations from the same family keeping Sabbath, keeping holy days, keeping God's law. Seven generations removed from the pagan influences of their great, 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 great grandfathers and mothers and so forth and so on. Wow. Now that is a feat and an honor to that family who can say those kinds of things. That's why what we're being told here is so valuable because it builds momentum in the culture and in the society and proceeds here and he says... Uh, you shall teach your children diligently unto your children. And verse 7, And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the posts of your house. On your, In other words, God will be surrounding you. Everything you do should be reflecting God. Your lifestyle, your habit, the things you say, the way you think, the way you talk. What you do should all reflect. Your lifestyle should be focused around these tenets and these doctrines and these, these particular principles and values and standards of which God wants you to reflect so that, guess what? Other people will begin perhaps to ask, you know, what, what, what do you, why do you get dressed up every Saturday and disappear, you know? Or, you know, I see you're a nice family had this happen one time in my life. I see you're a nice family. Why don't you rent my house? Wanted us to move from one house to the other. She comes out and accosted me while I was going to work. <laughs> but why, why do you, why do you the, it's, get these things to happen to you? Because you reflect. You show forth. You try to be what God wants you to be in these particular cases. He says here, And it shall be when the Lord your God shall have brought you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, this is verse 10, to Isaac and Jacob, give you great and goodly cities which you didn't build, and houses full of goods which you didn't fill, wells digged which you didn't dig, vineyards, olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full, beware lest you forget the Lord, he says, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And I dare say, the United States of America has forgotten. What we're consumed with now is the consumption that we consume. We are so distracted as a culture today. The MTV Awards are an abomination. Did you see that gyration going on, some of that stuff? I mean, it is unbelievable in public, and it's getting worse. I foresee the day when you're going to see nudity on just standard cable. You won't have to be considered an adult station. It'll just be that way. That's normal. Everybody's accepting it. We just continue to ratchet instead of ratcheting it up and aspiring. We keep ratcheting down and declining. I think we're uh, upside down, needless to say, in our priorities. Turn with me over here to 2 Thessalonians. 
2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, and in uh, chapter 2, verse 13, let me break into the context real quickly here. Chapter 2, because time is running out. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren. Paul uh, mentions here to the uh, Christians in Thessalonica, beloved of the Lord, because God has, from the beginning, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, see, he lays all this down, and then he says, therefore, it's because of this now, this reason, therefore, he says, and then he appeals, stand fast, hold to the uh, paradosis, the paradosis, hold fast to the paradosis, the Greek is, Hold fast to the traditions, it's translated in the English, and it specifically is alluding to Jewish traditions. That's what it's alluding to, the paradosis. And the same, the same uh, word, again, is used over here in verse 6. He goes on and he says again, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the paradosis. Those traditions. What traditions? Of Christmas and Easter? No. Holy days. Holy days. Over here in Corinthians, same word is used, but in the English you would miss it, translate it into a different English word so it hides under a different term. Nevertheless, it's the same Greek paradosis. Chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Be you followers of me, Paul states to the Corinthians, even as I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the paradosis, keep the ordinances. What ordinances? Brethren, the holy days, the Sabbath, the laws of Torah, those things that are so instrumental in developing the lifestyles that represent the God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as personified in the body embodiment of Jesus, the Christ, our Lord, who died for you and who died for me. Brethren, in reviewing the holy days, all I can say is thank God we can have such an opportunity to reconnect with the Father through Christ by virtue of understanding the clarity of expectation God has with us and for us as articulated, written, and recorded in the law of God.